Um, and yeah, here we go. First time's always the worst. You get used to it before long. You took it real good, homeboy. <laughs> you got a good conk. When Shorty let me stand up and see in the mirror, my hair hung down in limp, damp strings. My scalp was still flamed, but not as badly. I could bear it. He draped a towel around my shoulders, over my rubber apron, and began and began again vaselining my hair. Um, I could feel him combing straight back. First the big comb, then the fine tooth one. Then he was using a razor very delicately on the back of my neck. Then finally shaping up my sideburns. My first view in the mirror, wait, my first view in the mirror blotted out the hurting. I'd seen some pretty conks, but when it's the first time on your own head, the transformation after a lifetime of kinks is staggering. The mirror reflected Shorty behind me. We both were grinning and sweating. And on top of my head was this thick, smooth sheen, shining red hair. Real red. As straight as any white man's hair. How ridiculous I was. Stupid enough to stand there simply lost in admiration of my hair, now looking white. Reflected in the oh I'm sorry now looking now looking white reflected in the mirror in Shorty's room. Mm. I vowed that I would never again be without a conk, and I never was for many many years. Anybody remember that? Your rite of passage, your first perm. <laughs> Woo! It was terrible. I, I remember mine. I was in eighth grade and. Um, I had told a bunch of my girlfriends that I was going to get a perm after school. And so they all, and of course, this is my first time, so I didn't know. So they all reached their hands in my head, started scratching my scalp. Renita, Raquel, Samantha, who else? Just, and I was just like, they were, they were laughing. Ha ha, it's going to burn. So anyway, whoo, it burned and burned and burned. And... I definitely decided that I wasn't going to be without a perm for many years. And I'm so glad that I, um, that I came away from it. So anyway, that's me and this is him. This was my first uh, really big step towards self-degradation. De when I endured all of that pain, literally burning my flesh to have it look like a white man's hair, I had joined that multitude of Negro men and women in America who are brainwashed into believing that black people are inferior and white people are superior, that they will even violate and mutilate their God-created bodies to try to look pretty by white standards. I look around today in every small town and big city from two-bit catfish and soda pop joints into the integrated lobby of Waldorf Astoria, and you'll see conks on black men. And you'll see black women wearing these green and pink and purple and red and platinum blonde wigs. They're all more ridiculous than a slapstick comedy. It makes you wonder if the Negro has completely lost his sense of identity, lost touch with himself. N not much of that has changed. I guess I don't see too many black men with perms, but I definitely see... Um, just a majority of black women with perms and weaves and wigs straight. You'll see the conch worn by many, many so-called upper class Negroes. And as much as I can, as I hate to say it about them, on all too many Negro entertainers. One of the reasons that I've especially admired some of them, like Lionel Hampton and Sidney Poitier, among others, is that they kept their natural hair and fought to the top. I admire any Negro man who has never had himself conked or who has and had the sense to get rid of it, as I finally did. I don't know which kind of self-defacing conk is the greater shame, the one you'll see on the heads of black so-called middle class and upper class, or who ought to know better, or the ones you'll see on the heads of the poorest, most downtrodden, ignorant black men. I mean, the legal minimum wage ghetto dwelling kind of Negro, as I was when I got my first one. 
It's generally among these poor fools that you'll see a black kerchief over a man's head, like Aunt Jemima. He's trying to make his conk last longer between trips to the barber shop. Only for one special, only for special occasions is this kerchief protected conk exposed to show off how sharp and hip its owner is. Now that's changed. Now you might see more, uh, maybe do rags covering braids, corn rolls or something. But uh, I guess it just depends on what part of the country you're in. The ironic thing is that I have never heard any women, white or black, express any admiration for a conk. Of course, any white woman with a black man isn't thinking about his hair. But I don't see how on earth a black woman with any race pride could walk down the street with any black man wearing a conk, the emblem of his shame that he is black. To my own shame when I say all of this, I am talking first about myself because you can't show me any Negro who ever conked more faithfully than I did. I'm speaking from personal experience when I say when I say of any black man who conks today or any white wigged black woman that if they have if they gave the brains in their heads just half as much attention as they do their hair, they would be a thousand times better off. All right, y'all, that was the last uh, page of chapter three. If you ever want to just read that over to yourself or maybe you can rewind. He had he said a mouthful as Mr. Patty in the islands would say, he said a mouthful. Chapter four, Laura. Shorty would take me to groovy, uh, frantic scenes in a different, um, I'm sorry. Shorty would take me to groovy, frantic scenes in different chicks and cats and pads where the lights and the juke down mellow, everybody blew gauge and juiced back and jumped. I met chicks who were fine as May wine and cats who were hip to all happenings. That paragraph is deliberately, of course, that paragraph is deliberate, of course. It's just to display a bit more of the slang that was used by everyone. I respect it as hip in those days. I'm sorry I read that so slow. I'll read that again. That paragraph is deliberate, of course. It's just to display a bit more of the slang that was used by everyone I respected as hip in those days. And in no time at all, I was talking the slang like a lifelong hipster. Like hundreds of thousands of country-bred Negroes who had come to the northern black ghetto before me and have come since, I'd also acquired all of the fashionable ghetto adornments, the zoot suits and conks, that I have described, liquor, cigarettes, then reefer, all to erase my embarrassing background. But I still harbored one secret humiliation. I couldn't dance. I can't remember when it was that I actually learned how to dance, that is to say. I can't recall the specific night or nights, but dancing was the chief action that those pad parties. So I have no doubt about how and why my initiation I have no doubt about how and why my initiation into the Lindy Hop came about. With alcohol or marijuana lighting in my head and that wild music wailing all on those portable records, it didn't take long to loosen up the dancing instincts in my African heritage. All I remember is that during some party around this time when nearly everyone but me was up dancing, some girl grabbed me. They often would take the initiative and grab a partner, for no girl at those parties ever would dream that anyone present couldn't dance. And there I was, out on the floor. I was up in the jostling crowd, and suddenly, unexpectedly, I got the idea. It was as though somebody had clicked on a light in me. My long-suppressed African instincts broke through and broke loose. Having spent so much time in Mason's white environment, I had always believed and feared that dancing involved a certain order or pattern of specific steps as dancing is done by whites. But here among my own people, less inhibited people, I discovered it was simply letting your feet, hands and bodies spontaneously act out whatever impulses were stirred up by the music. From then on, Hardly a party took place without me turning up. <laughs> People use that now, huh? Turning up. 
inviting myself if I had to, and Lindy hopping my head off. Okay. Sorry. I hope that that doesn't go off again while we're reading. I'd always been fast at picking up new things. I made up for lost time now so fast that soon girls were asking me to dance with them. I worked my partners hard. That's why they liked me so much. When I was at work up in Rosalind's men room, men's room, I just couldn't keep still. My shine rag popped with the rhythm of those great bands rocking the ballroom downstairs. White customers on the shine stand especially would laugh to see my feet suddenly break loose on their own and cut a few steps. Whites are correct in thinking that black people are natural dancers. Even little kids are, except for those Negroes today who are so integrated as I have been, that their instincts are inhibited. You know those dancing jigaboo toys that you wind up? Well, I was like a live one. Music just wound me up. By the next dance for the Boston black folk, I remember that Lionel Hampton was coming into play. I had given my notice to the Roseland manager. When I told Ella why I quit, she laughed out loud. I told her I couldn't find time to shine shoes and dance too, so I needed to dance. She was glad because she had never liked the idea of my working at that no prestige job. When I told Shorty, he said he'd known I'd soon outgrow it anyway. Shorty could dance all night by himself for his own I mean, for his own reasons. I'm sorry. Shorty could dance all right by himself, but for his own reasons, he never cared about going to the big dances. He loved just the music making end of it. He practiced his saxophone and listened to records. It astonished me that Shorty didn't care to go and hear the big bands play. He had his alter sax idol, Johnny Hodges, with Duke Ellington's band. But he said he thought too many young musicians were only carbon copying the big band names on the same instruments. Anyway, Shorty was really serious about nothing except his music and about working for the day when he could start his own little group and gig around Boston. The morning after I quit Roseland, I was down at the men's clothing store bright and early. The salesman checked and found that I'd missed only one weekly payment. I had A1 credit. I told him... I just quit my job, but he said he didn't. that didn't make any difference. I could miss paying him them for a couple of weeks if I had to. He knew that I'd get myself straight. This time, I studied carefully everything in my size on the racks and finally picked out my second zoot. It was a shark skin gray with a big, long coat and pants ballooning out of the knees and then tapering down to the cuffs so narrow that I had to take my shoes off to get them on and off. With the salesman urging me on, I got another shirt and a hat and new shoes, the kind that were just coming into hipster style, dark orange colored with paper thin soles and knob style toes. This all added up to the 70 or 80, this all added up to 70 or $80. When I imagine this in my head, it, um, I think of like uh, the Disney movie Aladdin for some reason, you know, like those orange shoes and the way, he, I don't know. And then the fat at the knees tapered at the ankles. Yeah. And I know that those pants in Aladdin in the cartoon come from some other culture that I cannot think of right now. So I don't want to make a mistake and throw it out there. But yeah, that's when I imagine him as a character, like almost a cartoon character. All right, it costed him 70 or $80. It was such a red letter day that I even went and got my first barbershop conk. This time, it didn't hurt so much, just as Shorty had predicted. That night, I timed myself to hit Roseland as the thick of the crowd was coming in. In the thronging lobby, lobby I saw some real Roxbury hipsters. I am my zoo. From the fine women that were giving me the look. I'm sorry and some fine women that were giving me the look. I sauntered up to the men's room for a short drink from the pint that I had hidden inside of my coat pocket. My replacement was there, a scared, narrow-faced, hungry-looking little brown-skinned fella just in town from Kansas City. And when he recognized me, he couldn't keep down his admiration and wonder. I told him, keep cool, and he'd soon catch on to the happenings. Everything felt right when I went into that ballroom. 
Hamp's band was working, and that big wax floor was packed with people lindy hopping like crazy. I grabbed some girl I'd never seen, and the next thing I knew, we were out there lindy and away, grinding at each other. It couldn't have been finer. I'd been lindy and previously only in cramped little apartment living rooms, and now I had the room to maneuver. Once I really got myself warmed and loosened up, I was snatching partners from among the hundreds of unattached freelancing girls along the sidelines. Almost every one of them could really dance, and I just about went wild. Hamp's band was wailing. I was whirling girls so fast their skirts were snapping. Black girls, brown skins, high yellows, even a couple of the white girls were there. Boosting them over my hips, my shoulders, into the air. Though I wasn't quite 16 then, I was tall and raw-boned and looked like 21. I was also pretty strong for my age, circling and tap dancing. I was underneath them when they landed, doing the flapping eagle, the kangaroo, and the split. After that, I never missed a Roseland Lindy Hop as long as I stayed in Boston. The greatest Lindy dancing partner I had, everything considered, was a girl named Laura. I met her at my next job. When I quit shoe shining, Ella was so happy that she went around asking folks about a job for me, one that she would approve of. Just two blocks from her house, the Townsend Drugstore was about to replace its soda fountain clerk, a fellow who was leaving to go off to college. When Ella told me I didn't like it, she knew I couldn't stand those hill characters. But speaking my mind right then would have made Ella mad. I didn't want that to happen, so I put on my white jacket and started serving up sodas, sundaes, banana splits, shakes, and all the rest of the fountain stuff to, that those fancy acting Negroes wanted. Every evening when I got off at 8 and came home, Ella would keep saying, I hope you meet some of those nice young people your age here in Roxbury. But those panty annie squares who came in there putting on their millionaire airs. The young ones and the old ones both only annoyed me. People like the sleeping maid for Beacon Hill. White folks who used to come in. Are we still here? All right. Somebody called me and messed it up. Okay. Um, ooh, my dear manners for older, for order corn plasters in the Jews drugstore or black folks. Or the hospital cafeteria line serving woman sitting there on her day off with her cat fur around her neck, telling the proprietor she was a dietitian. Hmm. Both of them knowing she was lying. Even the younger ones at my age, whom Ella always was talking about. The soda fountain was one of their hangouts. They soon had me ready to quit with their accent so phonied up that if you even heard them and didn't see them, you wouldn't even know that they were Negroes. I couldn't wait for the eight o'clock I couldn't wait for 8 o'clock to get home and eat out of one of those soul food pots of Ella's. Then get dressed in my zoot and head for some of my friends' places and towns to Lindy Hop and get high or something for relief from those hill clowns. Before long, I didn't see how... Before long, I didn't see how I was going to be able to stick it out there for eight hours a day. And I nearly didn't. I remember one night I nearly quit because I had hit the numbers for 10 cents. The first time I had ever hit on one of those sideline bets that I'd made at the drugstore. Yes, there were several runners on the hill, too. Even dignified Negroes played the numbers. I won $60, and Shorty and I had a ball with it. I wished I had hit for the daily dollar that I played with the, my town man, paying him by the week. I would surely have quit the drugstore, and I could have bought a car. I could have bought a car. Anyway... Laura lived in a house that was catacorner across the street from the drugstore. After a while, as soon as I saw her coming in, I'd start making up a banana split. She was a real bug for them, and she came in late every afternoon after school. I imagine I'd been shoving that ice cream dish under her nose for five or six weeks before somehow it became, began to sink into me that she wasn't like the rest of them. She was certainly the only hill girl that came in there and acted in a way that was friendly and natural toward me. She had always, she always had some book with her and was poring over it. She would make a 30 minute job of that daily dish of banana split. I began to notice the books she read. 
They were pretty heavy school things, Latin, algebra, things like that. Watching her made me reflect that I hadn't read a new, even a newspaper since leaving Mason. Laura. I heard her name called a few times by the others who came in when she was there, but I could see that they didn't know her too well. They said, hello, and that was about the extent of it toward her. She kept to herself, and she never said more than thank you to me. Nice voice, soft, quiet, never another word, but no airs like the others, no black Bostonese. She was just herself. I liked that. Before too long, I struck up a conversation. Just what subject I got off on, I don't remember, but she readily opened up and began talking to me, and she was very friendly. I found out that she was a high school junior, an honor student. Her parents had split up when she was a baby, and she had been raised by her grandmother, an old lady on pension who was very strict and old-fashioned and religious. Laura had just one close friend, a girl who lived over in Cambridge, whom she had gone to school with. They talked on the phone every day. Her grandmother scarcely ever let her go to the movies, let alone on dates. But Laura really liked school. She said she wanted to go on to college. She was keen for algebra and she planned to major in science. Laura never would have dreamed that she was a year older than I was. I gauged that indirectly. She looked up to me as though she felt I had a world of experience more than she did, which really was the truth. But sometimes when she had gone, I felt let down, thinking I, how I had turned away from the books I used to like, <clears throat> thinking how I had turned away from the books I used to like when I was back in Michigan. I got to the point where I looked forward to her coming every day after school. I stopped letting her pay and I gave her extra ice cream and she wasn't hiding the fact that she liked me. It wasn't long before she had stopped reading her books when she came in and would just sit and talk with me for a while. And she soon began trying to get me to talk about myself. I was immediately sorry when I dropped that I had once thought about becoming a lawyer. She didn't want to let me rest about that. Malcolm, there's no reason you can't pick up right where you are and become a lawyer. She had the idea that my sister Ella would help me as much as she could. And if Ella had ever thought that she could help any member of the little family put up any kind of professional shingle as a teacher, a foot doctor, anything, why would you, why you would have to have to tie her down to keep her from talking in washing. I'm not sure what that means, but basically his sister would support him. I never mentioned to Laura, I never mentioned Laura to Shorty. I just knew she would never have understood him or that crowd, and they wouldn't have understood her. She had never been touched. I am certain she hadn't, or she'd never drink, or she, mm, or even had a drink, and she wouldn't even have known what a reefer was. It was a great surprise to me when one afternoon Laura happened to drop in that she just loved Lindy Hopping. I asked her how she had been able to go out dancing. She said she'd been introduced to Lindy Hopping after a party that had been given by the parents of some Negro friends. And, mm -hmm, sorry y'all. She'd been introduced to Lindy Hopping at a party given by the parents of some Negro friend just accepted by Harvard. It was just about time to start closing down the soda fountain. And I said that Count Basie was playing at the Roseland that weekend and would she like to go with me? Laura's eyes got wide. I thought I'd have to catch her. She was so excited. She said she'd never been there and she heard so much about it. She'd imagine what it was like. She'd have to give, she'd give anything to go, but her grandmother would have a fit. So I said, maybe another time. But the afternoon before the dance, Laura came in full of excitement. She whispered that she'd never lied to her grandma before, but she had told her that she had to attend some school function that evening. And if I'd get her home early, she'd meet me if I'd still take her. I told her that we'd have to go for me to change my clothes at the house. She hesitated but said okay. Before we left, I telephoned Ella to say that I'd be bringing a girl by on the way to the dance. Though I'd never before done anything like it, Ella, uh, Ella covered up her surprise. I laughed to myself at a long, a long time afterward about how Ella mouth flew open when we showed up at the front door. Me and a well-bred hill girl, Laura, when I introduced her, I was warm and sincere. And Ella, you would have thought that she was closing. I'm sorry. When I introduced her, 
sorry, Laura, when I introduced her, was warm and sincere. And Ella, you would have thought she was closing in on her third husband. While they sat and talked downstairs, I dressed upstairs in my room. I remember changing my mind about the wild shark skin gray suit I had planned to wear and deciding instead to put on the first one I'd gotten, the blue suit. I knew I should wear the most conservative thing I had. They were like old friends when I came back downstairs. Ella had even made tea. Ella's hawk eye just about raked my suit off my back. But I'm sure she was grateful that I'd at least put on the blue one. Knowing Ella, I knew that she had already extracted Laura's entire life story and all but had the wedding bells ringing around my neck. I grinned all the way to the Rosalind in the taxi because I had showed Ella I could hang out with Hill Girls if I wanted to. Laura's eyes were so big. She had almost none of her, she said almost none of her acquaintances knew her grandmother who never went anywhere but to church. So there wasn't much danger of getting it, it getting back to her grandmother that she was there. The only person she had told was her friend who had shared the excitement. Then suddenly we were in the Roseland Jocelyn lobby and I was getting waves and smiles and greetings. They shouted, my man, hey Red. And I answered, daddy yo. She and I never before had danced together, but that certainly was no problem. Any two people can lendy, any two people who can lendy at all can lendy together. We just started out there on the floor among a lot of other couples. It was maybe halfway through the number when I became aware of how she danced. If you've ever lendy hopped, you'll know what I'm talking about. With most girls, you kind of work opposite them, circling and sidestepping and leading. Whichever arm you lead with is half bent out, touching her waist, her shoulders, her arm. She's in and out, turning and whirling wherever you guide her. With poor partners, you feel 